So first thing that we need to do is we need to ask ourselves the following questions. One, do or did we love our parents for an inheritance? And um, I think you will appreciate this little Calvin and Hobbes comic that I've attached to it. I'll give you a few seconds to read it. Okay, so that is a very worldly view on inheritance is that uh, one day when mama or papa dies or grandfather or grandmother, that there will be an inheritance which will create some significant value to your life, be it wealth or sentimental. And um, now the, the question I'm going to ask again is, do we love our family members for that inheritance that we know is coming our way? Or do we, or did we, Come back, and we've got to go to Disney World and experience Disney World. You know, those kind of promises. Is that the way that we interpret love? It's through these promises that are made. So, does love equate to an expectation? All right, let's see if we can answer these three questions okay so we're going to start with the promise okay so this is a, a video that went viral the girl as you can see on the left is holding a teddy bear and then all of a sudden her dad hands her a real puppy and it is just a flow of tears afterwards of appreciation um, if you haven't seen it you need to google it it is the cutest thing on the internet. Okay, so there are promises in the Bible that we, as the followers of Christ, kind of attach our own value to. One of them being the promise of Abraham, that God would give Abraham the land and descendants more than he will ever be able to count. And then this promise was extended to Isaac and to Jacob and later to David with extension on that promise that there will be a royal bloodline in the bloodline of David. Do we serve God because we believe that God is a God of prosperity? Now, I know that we have already established the answer to that and Llewellyn, the other night in a remark, gave the perfect answer to that, where um, he said that if we serve a God of prosperity, then everybody would want to serve God, rather where if we just serve God out of love, um, then it's a whole different experience. Do we serve God? for the promise of eternal life. Now this is, I specifically um, into this promise because there is or was an article a couple of years ago where it says that, and it was written by either uh, atheist or um, somebody from a different uh, religion group that said that Christians only follow God because they want to achieve eternal life or etern uh, um, immort uh, immortality. That's actually the correct word that they were using. Now, I think that we need to also put a definition to the two words. There's a difference between life eternal and immortality. Um, if, if we look at the stigmata of immortality, that's normally 
a person that got bitten by a vampire and does not age and lives forever while everyone else lives. And whereas eternal life is something that we will only be granted when we die. And that is then when we have the resurrection. So I actually want to put in brackets behind that eternal life, quote unquote, eternal life. Uh, um, the resurrection. Okay, and we we have scriptural proof that this is a promise in one John twenty five. Um, John says, and this is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. And in in the book of John, Jesus says, Ver, uh, "Verily, verily, I say unto you." He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Okay, so I just also want to make this clear. Our religion, okay, call it now Christianity, call it being a disciple, be, call it whatever you want. Every religion has a specific promise attached to it okay so jewish people um and muslims all believe the promises of abraham that they will re receive the the land and that there will be um descendants counted to the billions okay buddhists believe that if they serve Buddha faithfully and according to their spiritual means, that they will achieve Nirvana, which is eternal, uh, um, internal and eternal peace. People from uh, the Hindi religions believe in reincarnation. So they live their lives as good as they can with the hope to be reincarnated into a better life. And if they lived a life of utter sin and, um, well, where they try and do everyone in, then they will be reborn as a rat and they need to restart after that, okay? Even the Nords in the belief uh, in their beliefs of Odin and Thor and Loki and all of that, believed that when they should die, they will go to Valhalla and then from there on um, will be transcended either to the underworld or to Asgard. Okay, so this is not a thing that is just isolated to us. It is in every religion, there is this promise for after death. I just believe that ours is more significant. All right. So before I could get to the question of how we should serve God, we kind of have to address the issue, well, not the issue, well, the question of the inheritance, because I said at the beginning that do we love our parents for an inheritance? Now, this inheritance of ours and a promise goes hand in hand because we believe that if we are faithful and if we follow Christ and if we are baptized and we serve people like Christ did and we proclaim the message of God to the best of our abilities, that we will be then, especially as Gentiles, included into the promises of Abraham. Okay? Now, this is where the inheritance comes in. What is inheritance? Inheritance is something that is given down a generation, whether the generation that it's given to has deserved it or not. Let's take the classic example of 
you live your life, all of a sudden you get a letter in the post of a rich uncle that died somewhere in Transylvania and you have to go now to this castle to have the world read and all of a sudden you have millions. We've seen the movies, we've read the books, okay? What have that person done to deserve that inheritance, okay? Also, when it comes to our grandmothers and grandfathers, If there is now a lump sum of money or be it a vehicle or a house or a painting worth a few thousand rand, what have I done to deserve that inheritance? And the short answer is, I have not. The only reason why I am inheriting is because the person who wants me to inherit has loved me. Okay. So that's now where the uh, difference between the promise and the inheritance comes in. We have this inheritance promised to us because God loved us. Okay. We have seen this in so many parts of the Bible. And we can go to uh, John 3 verse 16. Or um, one of my new favorites is 1 John 4, verse 19. We love because he loved us first. It's the same thing between a father and a mother and a newborn child. When that child is born in your normal, typical uh, families the mother and father has this immediate love for that child that infant does not know love it knows dependency it needs to eat sleep feed and excrement those are its four basic needs that it needs to do we as parents love them, we feed them, we put them to rest, we change them, and I can't remember what my fourth point was now. <laughs> but in any case, you get the idea, is we are looking after that dependent. And it's exactly what God does for us. Once again, there's so many promises um, in the book of Jeremiah, in the book of Isaiah, Jesus says it himself, look at the fields, look at the flowers. They do not dress themselves. They do not worry about tomorrow because God provides for them. Okay, and the same with us. So now I want to get to the question is how should we serve God? Now, the obvious question, uh, answer to the question is without expectancy we cannot serve god and expect that we will be saved and expect that we will be resurrected and expect that we will receive eternal life because what exactly have we done to deserve that from god How should we live our lives to serve God without expectancy? In Mark chapter 12, there's this beautiful vision of a poor widow that comes into the building. She goes to the collection box and she drops in two small coins. And Jesus then says to those around him, I will tell you the truth. This woman has put in more than any of us for those were her last coins. Did that poor widow expect that if she puts in her only money that God will grant her riches? Now, this, this is pure poetic license that I'm taking, but 
my personal belief is that it is no, she did not. She did it because that is what was right. She knew that she had to put it in her donation for the church because that is what God expected from her. And what does she expect from God? To look after her. She, did, uh, she might not expect God to make her rich, but maybe she would be as fortunate as the widow that took in Elisha, Elijah, sorry, and fed him with her last flour and oil throughout the whole drought. In Luke 15, verse 19, well, in the chapter 15, Jesus tells the parable of this. Uh, um, <laughs> of the prodigal son. Sorry. So we know the story. The son comes. He demands he's part of his inheritance. He takes his inheritance and squanders it. And then once everything is gone and the friends and the luxuries are gone, he goes and works on a pig farm. He has to eat what the pigs left in the uh, troughs. And then he comes to a sudden epiphany that even the slaves in his father's house, it's better than he does. So he's going to go back home and he's going to ask his father not to be his son, but to be his slave. He does not expect his father to take him back as a son, because he does not deserve it. And he says that in Luke 15, verse 19. I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. And of course, the story just gets chilling with love after that, because the father grabs him embraces him puts a ring on his finger dresses him has this major banquet for him because in his heart his son was dead but now he is alive in daniel chapter 3 nebuchadnezzar builds a statue and at the play of the harp or flute, you have to bow down and pray to the statue. And of course, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refuse this. So they are taken to be thrown into a fiery furnace. And Nebuchadnezzar gives them one last chance because he, he likes them. They have served him well. But now they don't want to obey his law. And then the Frio goes and says that they have the confidence that should they be thrown into that furnace, that God would save them. And then chapter, uh, verse 18, but even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have set up. They had the faith that God would save them, but they had not the expectancy that God had to save them. And of course, because they had that faith, God did exactly that. He sent an angel into that burning furnace to keep them safe. From the scorching heat, we, uh, we need to remember that that furnace was a thousand times warmer than normal. The guy that chucked them into the furnace died. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abnego were sitting, having a nice chill with an angel in the furnace. Because they did not expect God to save them, but they had the faith. 
that God would do so. Paul goes through a part of his life where he suffers and he's in pain. And three times he prays, he says, God, So his expectancy was that God must take this ailment away from him. That was his expectancy. But then God says, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So Paul carries on to say then, so now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses. So that the power of Christ can work through me. So to wrap it up, I'm just going to take these four examples that I've used. So how should we serve God? Like the poor widow, we need to give freely. We need to serve without expecting God to do anything in return. We need to give to others without expecting to receive from our earth to ourselves. You know, there's this um, little parable that I saw maybe two or three years ago about a mother giving her son two marbles and now he's got one in each hand. And now she wants to give him another one, but he can't take it because his hands is full. So, this, And the one that she wanted to give him was one that he really wanted. So he had to learn to let go, to give one away before he can get. But you see, that creates the expectancy. No, what we should do is to serve people without expecting gratitude from them or expecting recognition from them or the community for that matter. We need to be willing to wash the feet of the people we serve so that they might go and do that for someone else. We need to go into a poor community and feed them and preach the gospel of God without expecting to build the ecclesia there. Because if it's God's will, it will happen. But we should not have that expectancy. And especially we should not have the expectancy that God will give back. Most probably he will, and he will do it sevenfold. But that's not an expectancy that we should have. We should go back to God, no matter what we have done. We must do it with humility and with earnest in our hearts. We need to go to God and say, I am not worthy of being part of your promise. But please see me as your humble servant. We should live our lives as if we are working towards the resurrection and towards being welcomed by Jesus when he returns and saying to us, well done, good and faithful servant, you may enter. But when we are resurrected and we have fallen short, we should give thanks to God for the life that we have learned, lived in service of God even though we have fall short. And if we do not receive life eternal, that too is fine. We should have the faith of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that God will look after us, that God will protect us, but we should not be arrogant and expect it from God. 
God does not need to feed us, but he does because he loves us. And as long as we have that faith, that solid faith that God will look after us, then we will be all right. We will be good. And like Paul, we need to accept that we are weak. We are just mere humans. We are not perfect yet. And it is that weakness that God will exploit. And that he will create into a miracle. Llewellyn has done a beautiful talk on grace and I think you should actually record it for the YouTube channel. But that grace from God is exactly what we need. It is not too little. It is not too much. It is precisely that that we need. Like that woman that reached for the hem of Christ's robe, just hoping that if we can just touch the edge of the robe, that we will be healed, that we will be saved, that we will be forgiven. That weakness is what God wants to see in us. And if we try and hide it by ignoring it, then we are hypocrites. We need to be earnest and honest to ourselves and to God. Because one of the most important uh, commandments is love God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. And love your neighbor as you love yourself. Now that is a whole different topic for another day, but you cannot love anyone else if you do not love yourself for who you are. And that is a, a study that will come at a later stage, but um, right there on that note, I'm going to open up the floor for discussion.